Welcome everyone to the Bowden Family Shed. We've got something amazing behind me that you're all going to want to see. I personally think it's the most significant falcon find that we've seen for decades and it's just something so so special. It's a genuine phase three. It's been the one family from you, less than 5,000 miles, all original, unrestored, incredible backstory and the whole thing was crafted by that master Ron Harrop. So please hang around with us and you're going to check this out and you're going to love what you're going to see. So the car in question, the mighty phase three that's sitting behind me, it was ordered by a very unique individual by the name of Kingsley Hibbard. Now Kingsley was one of those guys and we all know one of them. He was a very polarizing person. Uh, he was a big guy in many ways, huge personality, a rather large frame on him. Uh, very adept at any kind of sports. He's clearly a natural athlete. Anything he tried, he excelled at. He was clearly quite a focused man. Perhaps that focus that he had was the reason that socially he was uh, at times a little bit of an outlier. Everyone had stories about Kingsley, my father included, uh, that involved him beating up bouncers, uh, being involved in illegal bare knuckle fights, getting into street races that went on for ever and ever with Di Tommaso Panteras, Lamborghini Quintashes. He was a real wild one and this car it sort of embodies Kingsley to a certain extent. So Kingsley went and ordered uh, Phase 3. They were clearly the car to have to go out and win. Kingsley had a little bit of a motor racing background. He was a class winner at the 62 Phillip Island 500, which in itself isn't a small feat. That race, of course, rolled on and become the Bathurst 1000. Kingsley wanted to get back in there. He had a fair bit of money behind him at the time. So what do you do? You go and order a brand new Phase 3. But Kingsley being Kingsley, he goes and orders a brand new Yellow Glow Phase 3 through Wright Ford. And then it arrives on a Friday. He's booked in for a race at Melbourne that Sunday, a series production race. So Kingsley jumps in the car on Friday, goes belting down the Hume Highway. That afternoon, uh, the proverbial hits the fan, I guess you could say, with uh, police and roadblocks and all the rest of this wild lunatic in a yellow phase three belting down the Hume Highway. It ended up making the headlines with 135 mile per hour chase and all this and all that. Uh, the funny thing is when you read the fine print, it says that it was actually the police officer who was doing 135 miles per hour and this car sitting behind me was pulling away from him at a rate of knots. Uh, just coincidentally, where they ended up getting him was at Broadmeadows. They parked some trucks across the front there. And then this is where it all gets a little bit grey. Uh, all these different stories then pop up about how Kingsley was caught. He tells a polite tale of he saw the trucks there and all the sirens and thought there was a big crash. So he got out of the car and walked over the police and said, what's the problem? To which they obviously cuffed him. Uh, there's other stories getting around that he actually booted into Broadmeadows itself, into the Ford head office, and tried to hide the phase three amongst all the other cars that were in the car park there thinking that it would just blend in probably picked the wrong color for that Kingsley uh, there's just tales and tales about that car chase uh, what it ended up doing strangely enough and a bit of a twist of fate it sealed this car's life as a serious production car so he went down to Melbourne got into the race itself uh, I think he DNF'd if I recall correctly um, but he drove it down there as a road car and then come Sunday on the racing days it by then had a correct works looking Ford Motor Company XY cage in it which I'm sure a few of you know is slightly different to the XWs and all the rest. Uh, it had the dump pipe coming out the right side at the right angle so clearly all the exhaust had been done through the whole way and it's really interesting to see that this guy could rock up into town on a Friday afternoon probably in a little bit of a flurry and then come Sunday, he's out there racing with everything just in the right spot and the car's cornering attitude and the whole lot all looking pretty impressive. Now, I don't know if that's testimony to the Phase 3 as itself as just a road car and how quickly it could be turned into essentially a race car. Or is it that he had a little bit of assistance there? Uh, I'm looking forward to when the magazine feature comes out to read about what actually happened with this Phase 3. Now anyway, I'll get back to what happened with this car and its series production life. So Kingsley got into a fair bit of trouble, uh, probably from all the way up down for that car chase. Handy ended up in court and all the rest. And uh, yeah, I think the media from that 
little bit of a bizarre occurrence. Didn't exactly serve him too well. So he did one more round as a series production car. That was at Oran Park, back up in Sydney. But he was entered for the Bathurst uh, 500. And the guy that ran the show back then was an ex-police officer. His name was Jack Hinksman. Now, Jack was renowned for being fairly no-nonsense, and I dare say if he was aware of Kingsley's shenanigans in this Phase 3 uh, and the speeds that were caught, he wouldn't want to associate his beloved motorsport with it. So Kingsley's entry for the Bathurst 500 never actually came to any fruition. Oddly enough, the Phase 3 that took his spot in his number, which was 63E, was another 63E in yellow, and that was raced by Bill Brown. Now, you GT historians would know what happened to poor old 63 that was raced by Bill Brown. It ended up bowling along the fence, and it's incredible that Bill, a good mate of mine, hi Bill, if you're watching, uh, ended up walking away. Bill was a bit lucky like that. But anyway, back to Kingsley. I'm sure he's a bit put out by the fact that his series production days were looking a little bit limited. He couldn't reach the top step that he wanted. And by then, he'd come to know Ron Harrop. And that's when I say Ron Harrop, I mean the Ron Harrop, the engineering guru who to this day is still doing amazing work. Now, Ron and Kingsley clearly hit it off. Ron was up and coming at that stage. He wasn't the Ron Harrop yet, but he was certainly on his way there. And Kingsley had a fair bit of money behind him, and he also had the ultimate weapon of choice at that particular time. Now, the two of them got together and thought, well, Ford Special Vehicles are making these Super Falcons, or they've made a Super Falcon by then. They weren't that successful, but I'm sure Ron had, had probably a little bit of a poke around it and realised what it was that made it a little bit more special than another Falcon, and they decided to apply that logic into this car. And the craftsmanship in this vehicle is exquisite. And I think I'm in a position to actually comment on that. We've owned the Moffat Mustang for quite a long time now. We've restored the um, Super Falcon that's just sitting over there to my left. And we've also restored the Beachy Monaro. And all three of which were contemporaries with this particular car. And I must say, Harrop's workmanship in this vehicle is absolutely on that level and in a lot of areas a lot higher very very clever man um, having the privilege to crawl through this car and look at the whole thing from bumper to bumper I can really see why Ron Harrop ended up becoming who he is he ended up becoming an amazing brand and if this is what he was doing back in the day when it was all just a little bit of guesswork then yeah Ron my hats off to you mate it is absolutely incredible what you did uh, it's just such a shame that uh, Kingsley and you never quite worked out this car, never got the driver perhaps that it needed, or either way, but that's history and that's life. So Ron and Kingsley got together. Kingsley had the money, supposedly, and Ron had the talent. And Kingsley, I might add, was a pretty bloody good driver. He was a natural athlete, as I mentioned earlier. So uh, you could probably see when they were all sitting around brewing up this car, in theory, it was a fantastic idea. So this magnificent yellow glow phase three with the help of ex Alan Moffat mechanic Barry Nelson uh, of course the master Ron Harrop and another amazing individual by the name of Chris Farrell who I had the pleasure of meeting quite a few times and Chris ended up bequeathing to us quite a bit of his memorabilia Chris was an incredible craftsman with metal and he did the guards on the uh, Beachy Monaro. He did a fair bit of work on the Moffat Mustang. And he also did the metal work on this particular car. So those lovely flared haunches that you see and how perfectly formed they are, that was all Mr. Chris Farrell. We do miss Chris around here. Every time he'd pop around, he'd always have a laugh and a story. And I know he would have absolutely adored pouring through this car. And I can only imagine the Kingsley Hibbard stories he would have had. But anyway, that's, uh, that's not to be. So we now get to Easter Bathurst 1972. Uh, that was a very famous race. It's, it's touted as Australia's greatest motor race ever between the Moffat Mustang and the Gagan Super Falcon. Now, on Conrod Strait, at practice leading up to that race, Hibbard was there in this majestic phase three, and people got into Kingsley's ear at Bathurst and said to him, mate, you've got to lift a little bit going down Conrod. Now, anyone that knows Kingsley know that telling him to lift at any stage is probably not a good idea. So Kingsley, of course, being Kingsley, kept it flat the whole way down Conrod. He got timed at 185 miles an hour, 
and that, then he was going over the crest and the rear wheels were lifting off the air and, and he's keeping his foot flat. So the old girl ended up getting buzzed well up into the nines. And even to this day, the telltale in that car is sitting there uh, dead set at six o'clock, spun all the way around at 10,000 RPM. Still sits there to this day, I kid you not. So unfortunately, the car absolutely detonated going down Conrod Strait. And by detonated, I mean like there was a huge hole in the side of the block. Uh, the car had, I believe, another two outings after that. And then that was her. Unfortunately, some money issues started to appear. And this is where the car takes a very, very interesting twist. Uh, Kingsley and Ron had a little bit of a falling out, which with Kingsley seemed to happen a little bit. And their issues ended up in court. So the poor car then came into limbo. Ron had it seized in his mechanical workshop. And there she sat, and this court case went on for years and years and years. But that is, ironically, what has saved the car and what has saved Ron Harrop's workmanship. By the time the vehicle was finally released and able to go and compete again, it was completely irrelevant. Uh, everything had moved on. Improved production was well and truly gone. Group C was the new thing. And the poor old girl just wasn't in the hunt anymore. So Kingsley still had a fair bit of money behind him, and obviously doing quite well for all of his various businesses he just put it into a shed and i wouldn't say forgot about it because anyone that would talk to him about it would uh he would talk very fondly of the car he still supposedly to the day he passed always spoke of the car as though it was going to have a second coming of some sorts and go out and rip everyone's head off but uh reality said otherwise and the car as you see it now i believe hasn't turned a wheel in anger since 1973 so she's really sat around for a long time. Uh, my father, David, saw the car in the very early 80s when he went and bought the Super Falcon from Kingsley Hibbard and he took a couple of happy snaps of it just as it sat there and he spoke to me a few times, um, or a lot of times actually over the years, about maybe we should go and have a chat to Kingsley about trying to buy this lovely old Falcon back off him. He wasn't too sure about the history of it and all the rest, but he knew it was the real deal. He knew it had been built by Ron Harrop. So we both, with those two simple ingredients, knew it would be an amazing car. You can tell there's a few points about this particular car I've not actually been too accurate about, but don't be annoyed with me. Don't get stressed. The experts at Australian Muscle Car Magazine have really delved into the facts on this car. They've gone the whole hog. They've got interviews with Ron Harrop, Barry Nelson, all these amazing people. It's coming out in early April, and I can assure you it's gonna be well worth the wait. So this amazing phase three, with all this incredible history stacked up behind it, uh, a genuine phase three in yellow glow, owned by the one family from New, less than 5,000 miles, built by the master craftsman, Ron Harrop, to go and compete against the Super Falcon, the Moffat Mustang, the Beachy Monaro, and all the rest. And it's an absolute, time warp condition i'm talking like it was just turned off and that's it it is an incredible car so if you're looking for a genuine piece of australian motorsport folklore that has no dramas about whether it's real or whether it's fake different scenarios that can occasionally pop up this car is it it's an incredible automobile it's been an absolute privilege to be a part of it we're all certainly amazed by the standard of the build the history that's involved with it, the personalities that have been involved with the car, which is also so important. And the fact that the Hibbards had the foresight just to leave it as is, where is. They could have done so much to it just to make it a little bit prettier, a little bit more presentable, but they actually would have spent a lot of money just devaluing this incredible asset. So I implore you, if this sounds like your type of car that you're looking to add to your collection, please come and talk to us. We'll love taking you through it and explaining a little bit more to you about why this car is so special.